That was quite the introduction, Phil. <laughs> Needs no introduction. <laughs> Terry Heppala. <laughs> the Finlander from New York Mills. How, how long should I go, Terry? What do you want? You're, you're fine. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Let us bow our heads briefly for a word of prayer. Heavenly and ever gracious Father, in you we trust. Amen. For those of you here tonight that I've not yet met, my name is Terry Heppola. My wife Diane and I own a small business here in Perm called Allegro Marketing. Through our website, we design, produce, and sell graphics and displays to businesses all across the U.S., helping them promote their businesses at trade shows, exhibits, business fairs, and conferences. Diane and I have been married for 37 years. In addition to being my wife, Diane is my business partner and best friend. And for those of you wondering, yes, Diane and I are pretty much together 24 hours a day, seven days a week. For those of you now wondering, no, we don't know how we do it, but it works well for us. Diane and I have two grown children. Corey, who is a television sports anchor for Comcast, Sportsnet, in Houston. Corey's wife, Camille, is public relations director for the district attorney's office in Houston. Our daughter, Chelsea, is a fourth grade teacher here at Heart of Lakes in Perm. Her husband, Andy, is the marketing director for us at Allegro Marketing. And Chelsea and Andy have one daughter, our first and only grandchild, Drew, who is now 20 months old. In my life's journey, there have been numerous events. Many I remember, most I don't. Some were life-changing, but most were simply life events. What I'd like to share with you tonight are what I refer to as God things. Things that in my journey and in Diane's not only change our lives, but also our faith. Thursday, May 8th, 1986. The day before my 30th birthday. I wasn't really wild in my younger years, and I guess you could list my name under the average column. However, I was one for making sarcastic comments. And one such comment was about to play a major role in changing my life. For whatever reason in my younger years, I had thought that it was comical to joke saying, if I ever live to see 30, it's going to be a miracle. Well, to this day, I don't, know re don't remember when or why I started saying that, or where I said it, or even how many times I may have said it, but I clearly remember saying it. What I also remember very clearly was driving home from work that May 8th evening, very cautiously, and seriously questioning in my mind if all my joking had in fact been a premonition to my own imminent demise. Would I live through that night? Would I live to see my 30th birthday or not? As most of you know by now, I didn't die that night. <laughs> and possibly as you're wondering right now, what in the world does that have to do with this message? A God thing. At the time of my 30th birthday, Diane and I were both working for our brother-in-law, Dean Simpson. He had opened Dean's Country Market and Perm almost 10 years earlier, and from the beginning, I was the store manager. Diane was the bookkeeper. It was a good gig for both of us, and we enjoyed a pretty secure life. But my living to see 30 was about to cause us 
to take a sharp left turn. You see, shortly after my birthday, I became restless. What if I had died? I wouldn't have accomplished my life's goals. I wanted my work and life to be more challenging. I reasoned to myself and to others that I was going through a midlife crisis and I needed to make a life change. I was told the restlessness would pass. It didn't, and I proceeded to make one of the crazi craziest moves that I could have ever made. In 1987, less than a year later, I had convinced myself and Diane to answer that restless voice in my head. And so we did. I resigned my management position. Diane resi resigned her bookkeeping position, and we instantly became small business entrepreneurs. It was exhilarating, like uh, I would assume parachuting out of the plane for the very first time might be. But after my sh chute opened and I had drifted to the ground, I quickly began to realize Diane and I were now unemployed. Or should I say, employed by a business that had no business. Enter stress. I loved photography, so opening a photo studio was the logical choice for this new endeavor, and Photos Unlimited was born. Wedding, portrait, dance, and baby pictures soon taught me that loving something as a hobby doesn't always translate well into a full-time profession. I also learned that hanging out your shingle doesn't guarantee customers. My dream of owning my own business was turning into a nightmare on the nights I was able to sleep. Many nights, Diane and I would lay awake worrying how we were going to pay upcoming bills. Week after week, our little business struggled. Day after day, we dealt with the stress, the worry, and the anxiety of not knowing what tomorrow might bring. We made decisions on which bills to pay today. We made decisions on purchases we would need to do without. We survived by the slightest of margins, but we had each other. We had our children. By now, the stress caused by potential failure was beginning to wear us down. And then, a God thing. The decision about our home. How will we make our mortgage payment this month? Where can we cut? What can we do? Fears, tears, worry, stress. I suggested we stop giving our pledge to the church. There would be no discussion. Diane told me that was not an option. I agreed. We would not cut our giving regardless of what happened. Diane wrote out a check for our offering to Calvary, and we brought it to church on Sunday. The next week, the job came in allowing us to make our house payment. And so it went. How will we make this payment? Here's a job. How will we make that payment? Here's a job. Our business continued to struggle, but we did begin to grow. Not a lot. But enough that the struggles eventually became fewer, the stress became slightly less, and the worry, well, the worry never really went away. Looking back, in God I did not trust. Matthew 6 says, I will tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than 
than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Much easier words for me to read than they are for me to live by. And then a God thing. It was about this time that I came across a little book called God Owns My Business, in which author Stanley Tam introduces himself by stating, in over 47 years of business life, I have found Christ to be the source of all my needs. Every time he takes me through a valley, he brings me out stronger, wiser, and more dependent upon him. My life and devotion for him grow each year. He gives me a purpose with which to live. After reading Mr. Tam's book, I began to understand that our business was much like his. Looking back, God had played a huge role in leading us to where we were at that moment. God had played a huge role in putting that little book into my hands. Over time, our little business evolved. By now, I was back in advertising. I designed brochures and logos. I now photograph buildings and machinery and food products and more, all of which eventually evolved even further into a packaging and pre-press, packaging design and pre-press business. We hired some employees, we bought some equipment, we rented more space. But still, in God, I did not trust. As our business plugged on, my fear of failing drove me. I worked 60 hours minimum and up to 80 hours a week. I went to work early, I came home late. I worked nights, I worked weekends. I sacrificed a fair number of our children's life events in order for our business to be successful. For 12 years, we managed to survive. <clears throat> we adapted to the changing marketplace, maintaining a a slow yet steady paced growth, and we eventually outgrew our office space. We realized that in order for our business to continue to grow, we would need to take on more debt and build. On August 13th, 2001, we moved into our new offices with great expectations for our future. Twenty-nine days later, our business changed forever. I remember the day as clearly as if it was yesterday. That's because on Tuesday, September 11th, 2001, 9-11, the business that we had worked so hard to build, put so many hours into and had neglected, Family four, family four began to crumble. We all remember where we were that day, what we felt, what we feared. Little did I know that in the days, weeks, and months that were going to follow, our phones would go silent, projects would be canceled, customers would stop spending. We laid off one of our employees, and laid awake nights wondering who would be the next to go. January 2002, one of our clients called and requested to meet with me. During our meeting, I was asked to accept a position with a company that he worked for as VP of Marketing and Sales. The company had been around for many years and new ownership was looking to change, to update and modernize their business. Would I consider working for them? They made me an offer. I was flattered. I was confused, and I was scared. After several sleepless nights and many hours of conversation, Diane and I decided our business could no longer afford to keep everyone on the payroll, and so we cut my position. I had failed. Monday, February 4th, 2002, 146 days after 9-11, I began a whole new chapter in my life and the lives of our family. It had been years since I had answered to someone other than myself. 
I was nervous, yet excited at the same time. The opportunity to affect change within this company was invigorating. Outside consultants were brought in to make recommendations, new people were hired, stimulating new ideas were brainstormed, new processes were examined, change was catching fire, or so I thought. The honeymoon was soon over. Talking change and putting change into action were two different things. And it quickly became apparent that actually doing change wasn't going to happen, at least not anytime soon. I could not do what I thought I had been hired to do. I did not renew my contract. I had failed again, a God thing. In the meantime, our business had successfully stayed afloat. 20 months after leaving, I returned, this time armed with a wealth of knowledge, a college degree per se, and how not to run a business. I reread God Owns My Business and found the author's words to be especially true in my life now. Every time he takes me through a valley, he brings me out stronger, wiser, and more dependent upon him. In God We Trust took on new meaning. I started to pay more attention to where God was leading. I fought his direction less often. I began affecting change within our company. We reluctantly let go of many of the things we had done in the past. We embraced the internet. We looked for new ideas. And we boldly set out to go where we had never been before. I was starting to trust in God's plan. And then, a God thing, another book. The Power of Focus was the book. What the world's greatest achievers know about the secret to financial freedom and success. Admittedly, I bought this book searching for ideas on how to become the successful business owner. However, as I began to read it, I'd heard all of it before. We have heard it all before. If we're, not, if we're not growing, we're dying. If we're not moving forward, we're moving backward. We can do anything, we can be anyone we want, if we just work hard enough. And there it was. Did you hear it? Hidden within all the book's secrets to my finding financial freedom and success was the next God thing. Am I a successful husband? A successful father or friend? Am I a successful human being or a successful Christian? As a husband, as a father, or as a friend, as a Christian, am I growing or am I dying? Am I moving forward or backward? Am I willing to work hard enough to become the person I truly want to be. If we really want something, wishing it to happen doesn't make it happen. Praying to make it happen is not likely to make it happen either. Years earlier, I had learned that talking change and doing change were two completely different things. Doing change was much harder. Becoming better at something tomorrow than I am today takes total focus, along with an uncompromising commitment to grow. The book Power of Focus, My God Thing, says it's not hocus-pocus, it's all about focus. Proverbs 4 says, look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. Mark out a straight path for your feet, stay on the safe path, don't get sidetracked, Keep your feet from following evil. Again, much easier words for me to read than they are for me to live by. I don't remember the specific date, but I do remember where I was. Walking after work with Diane around the neighborhoods bordering our business office. We oftentimes would walk together and talk about our kids and things they were involved in. We would also talk business. However, this walk on this day was different because on this day we started a deep discussion 
about our Christian faith. While Diane and I each had faith, we had our own. And as strange as it seems, we never talked deeply or shared openly with each other about our personal faith. That was until that day. While we walked and we talked and we shared and God did his thing. Diane and I are truly blessed. Family, friends, business, yes. But more than that, we're blessed with a God who loves us, who watches over us, who leads us in his direction. And for all God is, we are ever grateful. Psalm 105 says, Give thanks to the Lord and proclaim his greatness. Let the whole world know what he has done. Sing to him, yes, sing his praises. Tell everyone about his wonderful deeds. Exalt in his holy name. Rejoice, you who worship the Lord. Echoing the words again of author Stanley Tam, in my life, I have found Christ to be the source of all my needs. Every time he takes me through a valley, he brings me out stronger wiser, and more dependent upon him. My love and devotion for him grow each year, and he gives me a purpose with which to live. A plaque hangs in our home, which has become a daily reminder of the man I want to be and the way I strive to live my life. And it simply reads like this. Live in such a way that those who know you but don't know God will come to know God because they know you. Life is a journey. There will be valleys ahead. In God, we trust to guide us through. Amen.